Okay, uh, we've been looking at this series. We are now in the fifth I am. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life in chapter 11, verse 25 there. And you notice that he says it in the context of a very popular Christian story, which is the resurrection of Lazarus. And uh, I would like for us to examine this story and see how the resurrection of Lazarus actually points to 11.25, where Jesus says that I am the resurrection and the life. Remember, Lazarus is only raised from uh, verse 38 onwards. But before Lazarus is raised, Jesus makes another claim about himself, that he is the resurrection and the life. Uh, the reality of our world today is that there's death. Uh, all of us will die if the Lord continues uh, to tarry, um, we will all face death. We have experienced death. Uh, our friends die. Uh, our family members die. We go and mourn together with them, uh, just as the Jews and Jesus and his disciples mourned with Martha and Mary when Lazarus died. So it's a reality. We see it around. We see it in the news. We read about it. It's even in movies and books. Uh, death is ever there to remind us of our fallen nature and the judgment of God and the wrath of God. And death demands an answer. It's one thing to see someone else die. It's one thing to watch a movie or to watch the news and hear that someone has died. It's a completely, other, it's a completely different thing when we ourselves are facing death. And I hope that today uh, we will uh, come out of here with an answer for death's demand. When death comes knocking at your door, when you are facing terminal illness, cancer, for example, when you are in danger, uh, there are violent people around you and it is clear that they intend to harm you and uh, most likely you will die when you are being persecuted, uh, for example, uh, for being a Christian, what is the answer that a Christian has for death? Of course, one of those is we grieve and we mourn, uh, but Jesus Christ comes and expands the worldview of the Christian. He brings into a complete picture what death is in Christ. And that's what we will see here today. So Jesus has power over death. That's one of the things that we'll see. And he can do something about it. And faith in him gives us an appropriate answer to death when death comes knocking on our doorsteps. Let's see the first part. So, in the death of Lazarus, I will, we will talk about the death of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus, and then that will help us build 11.25, and we see the significance of 11.25. So Jesus, first of all, says with our verse that he is, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Then he asks Martha, do you believe in this? This is not the first time Jesus is saying the I am statement accompanied by a miracle that points to him as what he has just said. The very first time we looked at Jesus as I am the bread of life. And what had he just done? He had performed this miracle where he multiplied bread and he was able to feed the hungry masses and there was enough left over. There was an abundance that satisfied them. And that pointed to Christ as the bread of life who is able to impart to us spiritual life. He's able to sustain that life and he's able to banish death spiritual death, and even physical death upon our resurrection 
when compared to the manna that the Israelites had in the wilderness. And then uh, we next saw how Jesus Christ was the light of the world. And what miracle accompanied that? We saw that he had healed the blind man in chapter 9. He, he is the light of the world. Uh, I think it's not chapter 9, it's actually much earlier. But he's the light of the world. Um, and that miracle accompanies that to, to show that Jesus Christ is the one who uh, shows us the way to the Father. Uh, so that we do not walk in darkness. He's the one who paints things as they really are. What our deeds are, he's able to tell us this is sinful and this is righteous. And we again saw that Jesus as the light of the world. If you, if you follow the light, you will not walk in darkness and you'll have life. Now we're about to see Jesus as the resurrection and the life. And the miracle that accompanies this, the sign that accompanies the Jesus Christ uh, Jesus Christ's statement that he is the resurrection and the life is the bringing back to life of Lazarus. And these signs are not just there for the sake of uh, showing how powerful Jesus is. They're there to really point us to all those things that we've been seeing are connected to Jesus as the bread of life. If he's the bread of life, the, 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 the main, the core part of him being the bread of life for us is tied up in him giving up his flesh. If he is the good shepherd, is the good shepherd who does what? Who lays down his life. If he is the door, he is the door by whom sheep enter into the kingdom. The same is true here. Jesus is the resurrection and the life because he is the Messiah. He wants us to know that he's the one whom God sent to save us from our sins. He's the one whom God sent to bear our sorrows and griefs upon himself. He's the one who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one through whom this death and resurrection points forward, looks forward, to the cross where he will die for us and he will then resurrect three days later to show how victorious he is over death. In fact, this miracle right here is the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. If you look to verse 45, you will see that Compared to other times where the Jews talked about killing Jesus Christ behind the scenes by themselves, they, in this instance, convene a council. The Sanhedrin actually meets and they discuss how to kill Christ. That many of the Jews, therefore, what come with Mary had seen what, uh, had seen what he did, believed in him, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them that Jesus, what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who's, who was a high priest that he said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it should be better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Of course, we know Caiaphas uh, from other accounts uh, in the gospel. It was in his house, if you read Luke, that they met to plan to kill Jesus. Uh, he was the one who incited the people that Jesus should die. So this is Caiaphas' heart. He's thinking about Jesus Christ's death. He's thinking about the murder of Christ for the sake of their own selfish ambitions, that they may maintain that leadership that they have over Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. But we see in God's providence the way Balaam cursed the Israelites and all the words that came out of his mouth were not curses, but rather blessings. We see how God 
sovereign over the speech of man, sovereign over every event, uses those same words to communicate the real glorious purpose, those words that are meant to harm Christ, those words that are meant to hatch his death, the plan of his death and execute it, they become words of hope where verse 59, 51 says he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. This echoes back to Jesus being the good shepherd who will gather the sheep from other folds that are not the fold of Israel. So that from that day on, when we go back to the flow of things, there was that break where Caiaphas is planning for the death of Christ for his own purposes. Then God, there's an interlude in between. John puts that commentary there. And then we go back into the story that says from that day on, they made what? Plans to put him to death. And because it was not yet Jesus' time, what does Jesus do? He retreats. He says, Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. That's the significance of this sign of raising Lazarus uh, from the dead. So, we want to look at some phrases, particularly around this word, belief. All along we've talked about belief, that eating Jesus as the bread of life means to what? To believe in him, right? Yeah, that entering through the door means to believe in him. Coming to the good shepherd means to believe in him. Here again, the call remains to be the same. We want to see how uh, believing and glorifying God go hand in hand. So belief and the glory of God. They go hand in hand. One of the ways in which you can glorify God, one of the ways in which God receives glory is when we believe in him, when we believe in the Son of God, when we believe in the one whom was sent to die for us. And he has revealed that to us. Let's read. Consider verse 4. What does verse 4 say? As we read that, you know, Lazarus is ill. Uh, they send words, Mary and Martha, to Jesus that the one whom you love is ill. Do something. You love him. But what does Jesus say in verse 4? But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be what? Glorified. The death is for the glory of God. I've said that he is glorified when unbelievers accept him by faith. And when the faith of those who already believe in him, I would add, is strengthened. We will see how verse 4 will be fulfilled, how God will be glorified, and how people will believe in this story. And that comes about not because belief is something that is inherent in us, but the Holy Spirit takes these words, the Holy Spirit takes the signs, the Holy Spirit takes whatever Jesus proclaims and applies that into our hearts. So I hope that even by the end of this, the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus back to life will not just remain a marvelous story, but will apply to your own hearts. If you are a Christian, you should be strengthened in your faith that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And if you are not a Christian, you should be challenged 
Because if you do not believe in Jesus Christ as the resurrection and the life, you are stating by way of living, by way of the convictions that you have, that he is not the resurrection and the life. You are declaring in your unbelief that death has the final say for you. That there is nothing beyond the grave for you. That you will be separated from God who is life and love and wisdom when you die. Jesus never leaves you neutral. The last time we can take a, a brief survey, when he said that he was the good shepherd, chapter 10, verse 19, what was the response? There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? If we go all the way to chapter 8, that we uh, saw Jesus as the light of the world, the response was the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. You never remain neutral when Jesus Christ makes these kinds of claim in your presence. You have to take a stand. In chapter 6, what happened? The Jews disputed among themselves. They grumbled among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? That was their response. But then there have also been glorious responses in uh, the book of John. For example, in chapter 6, even though we didn't go all the way there, chapter 6, Peter had a glorious response. If you go to chapter 6, all the way in verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That's one of the responses that is there. Go to chapter 1. Verse 29, chapter 1, verse 29, some of the responses. The next day, that is John the Baptist, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What about Andrew in verse 41? How does Andrew respond? He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found who? The Messiah, which means Christ. What of Philip in verse 45? Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What of the Samaritans who are not Jews? The very people, uh, these the Jews, Jesus came to the, the Jews, his own. They rejected him. He was pleading with them. But these Samaritans who were rejects, chapter 4, verse 42. Chapter 4, verse 42. They said to the woman, this is the woman who was at the well, had the interaction with Christ. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed who? The Savior of the world. There is always a division. You can never remain quiet and silent about Jesus Christ when he says who he is before you. Even Judas continued to remain with Jesus Christ, but we all know that he was not a believer. He remained for his selfish gain. He remained, if you continue to verse 12, uh, because, you know, he helped himself with the pass. The collections that were given to Christ to support the ministry helped himself to that. And he was the one whom would betray Christ. So it is very possible to be a Judas that you would hear Christ make these claims and instead of walking away, you remain yet still in unbelief waiting for your time to come. So brothers, as you go through the, as we go through the series and Jesus says these things, respond. Knock on your heart and seek a response. What does Martha say when Jesus Christ 
declares that he is the resurrection and the life. Let's go to 11.25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. What one question does Jesus ask Martha immediately after saying he's the resurrection and the life? Do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? And it is a very trying moment because Martha has just lost her brother. She's mourning. She's grieving. The brother is rotting. It's been four days now. And Jesus asks, after declaring that I am the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And what does Martha respond? How does Martha respond in verse 27? She gives a positive answer, just like John the Baptist, just like Andrew, just like Philip, just like the Samaritans. She says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. It is a comprehensive answer, covering all that Christ is to her and to the people and to them. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is sent to be the Savior of the world. He is the Son of God. So my question to you today is that, what's your response to Jesus Christ's claim that he is the resurrection and the life? He said in verse 4, but when Jesus had it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That's not the only place that he says that. Let's examine chapter 11, verse 15. Jesus repeats, after telling you know, the disciples that Lazarus is asleep, the disciples don't get it, but he then says plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there. This is a good thing that has happened. I am glad that I was not there, so that you may what? Believe. But let us go to him. Belief pops up again. Is there another place that Jesus Christ reminds us of the importance of the belief, what glorifies God? We've already looked at verse 25. Now, when Martha made this profession, this confession of faith, when she said, I have believed, it's something that's settled within me. Martha is just like all of us. We, when we come to faith, it's true. When the Lord draws us, when God draws us to Christ, we truly believe with a living faith. It is real. If God has saved you, it is a real salvation with which you have been saved. But that does not mean that we are now sinlessly perfect, for example. That does not mean that we are now spared from the sorrows and woes of this world. Many times in your Christian walk, in spite of your belief in Christ, you will reach low moments when it will seem dim. Your hope will just be glimmering. It's like from afar. You believe in Christ, but you believe in Christ. You know, when challenges come. And we see that Martha, losing her brother, she's grieving. She swings between the two sides where her hope blazes. It's ferocious, it's alive, it's bickering, as it were. And then at times, her hope glimmers. At times she looks at Christ and says, yes, I believe. 
At times she looks at the corpse of her brother and doubt and despondency come. We can look at verse 24, for example. Just before Jesus Christ makes the statement that I am the resurrection and the life, Martha says, I know when, 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 when Jesus in verse 23 says, your brother will rise again. First of all, actually, let's start from verse 21 or 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She knows. She even says, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. But it doesn't sink in the mind and heart of Martha that Jesus Christ saying that he is the resurrection and the life in the next uh, uh, verse does not limit Jesus being the resurrection and the life to the last day, which he says, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. That is very much true. We will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Those who are in Christ, the resurrection to life. And those who are not in Christ, the resurrection to judgment. So it's true. But Jesus here means much more. That's why I was saying he comes to expand our view of death as Christians. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. At that very moment, Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. He is always the resurrection and the life. He has ever been the resurrection and the life. And that's an encouragement to my soul. When a brother passes away and I'm close by, I know that Christ, who is ever present with us, he, he says he's the resurrection and the life. He does not say that he will be the resurrection and the life. He is already the resurrection and the life. And therefore, we can mourn with hope that this brother has died with the Lord. This brother who believed in Jesus, though he is dead, yet he is alive. And me, who is alive right now, and I believe in Jesus, I will never die. That's the challenge uh, that I get from this and I would uh, also pass on to you. How do you mourn? How will you view your own death when death comes knocking at your door, as I started earlier? For whatever reason. What's, what's the other side of, of this? So we have seen verse 24 where uh, Martha is trying to, you know, almost, you know, uh, um, manage her expectations of what Jesus can do. Yeah? She says, yeah, your brother will rise again. And she thinks to add, ah, yeah, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He, he uses the present tense. Verse 39, let's see this other side of Martha. Jesus said, Take away the stone. And then Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an order, for he has been dead four days. He's like, why are you rolling away the stone? But Jesus reminds her of what he had said in verse 4, in the next verse, Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see what? The glory of God. Belief and the glory of God go hand in hand. If you believe, you have seen the glory of God. So we see that in our Christian life, yes, we might believe. All these things. We might believe that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. We might believe that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. We might believe uh, that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd and the door. We might believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. But 
It's only natural for us in those difficult moments to be like Martha. We, we want to manage our expectations. We don't want to take the word of Jesus Christ as it is. We are doubtful when he says he will rise again. We are doubtful sometimes when he says that he has not left us as orphans. We have the Holy Spirit with us who gives us the power to live as he has called us to live, transformed lives. We are doubtful when he says that everything works together for the good of those who love him. We are doubtful when he says he will come again to judge the living and the dead. We are ever doubtful. So Christian, I would encourage you to hear the words of Christ and believe them. Truly believe them. They are true. That even as you face death, Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. You are in him. You believe in him and your death is not the end of everything. In fact, your death ushers you into glory. It is indeed, as the obituaries put it, a promotion to glory. At your moment of death, that is very true. If you are in Christ, you have life. It can never be taken away from you. Nothing shall separate you from the love of God, as Romans 8 puts it. At your point of death, that remains very true. It is a comforting thing. And Jesus had a sign that the Holy Spirit may use that sign of a man rotting in a tomb, brought back to life by the voice of Christ, a cry, a loud cry, Lazarus, come out. That sign is there that the Holy Spirit may impress it upon our hearts to remind us that this Jesus whom we, we believe in is the resurrection and the life. And if you are alive, you do not need to fear. If you believe in Christ, you shall never die. Nothing can separate you from him, as I've said. He is more than able to set death aside as he resurrected Lazarus. Now, a while back, I was in medical school uh, training to be a doctor, but I left. And, you know, when you join medical school, you, your professors don't tell you that, you know, once you have set foot in your end, you are as good as a doctor. Do you believe this? If you believe this, you'll become a doctor. They don't say that. You have to work six grueling years and do your internship, and then you become a doctor. And being a doctor is an infinitely less thing compared to being with Christ. It is greater gain. It is as enormous as God is himself. And what do you need to do? Do you need to work hard for many years and then you say, I have attained it, I have achieved it, I have gotten it, it is now mine. The very words of Christ just demand one thing. He asks, do you believe? It is by faith that you accept. You don't have to do some mathematics to come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. You don't have to go to a lab. You don't have to consult philosophers. He just says, believe, and it is for you. Do you believe this? Christ ever asks, do you believe this? That's his one demand, the work of faith, that gift which he gives us, and then we apply it upon him as the object of our faith. That's all Christ usually, or all the time rather, asks for. Do you believe this? Did I not tell you 
That is verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And of course, they rolled away the stone. And then Jesus says a prayer, I know, or I knew that you always hear me. But I said, this is verse 42, I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me what, 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 what Martha confessed. The one who is coming into the world, the one who has been sent by the Father, the Messiah, the Christ. This is him praying to the Father. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around. These Jews who had gone to mourn with the sisters. And then we saw Martha was the first one to meet Christ. And then Martha goes back to the house and informs Mary that the teacher is asking for you. And as Mary runs out, these Jews who are previously unfriendly to Christ, they run following Ma Mary thinking that, you know, she's going to weep some more and they want to be with her. Perhaps they were professional mourners, who knows? Little do they know that they're walking into this miracle. They're walking into this prayer. But I say this on account of the people standing around, those Jews, the disciples, Martha and Mary. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Verse 45, read it with me. Many, many of the Jews therefore who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, did what? Put their faith in him. Faith in him believed in him. Has God been glorified? Yes, he, has. he has been glorified. That is the purpose of this this illness does not lead to death it is for the glory of god so that the son of god may be glorified through it the glory of the son of god and the glory of god are one when we glorify the son him who is the resurrection and the life him who is the bread of life him who is the light of the world him who is the good shepherd him who is the door of the sheep him who is the way the truth and the life when we glorify him we glorify god and how do we glorify him believe it is the highest form of glorifying christ that you as an unbeliever right now can glorify god there's no other way you can glorify god except by believing in Christ. Oh, and if you are a believer, may your faith be strengthened. Believe in him some more that God may be glorified. Believe in him even at your point of death. Believe in him even more when a brother has passed away or a sister has passed away and you are there. How does the Lord view us he loves us. Twice we are told that he did what? He loved Lazarus. Just go to verse 3. This is from the mouth of the sisters. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. He doesn't just love the Lazarus who, are, who is dead, verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he's weeping, look at Christ full of love, able to sympathize with us, taking our pain and our sorrow to his heart. He truly bears our griefs and sorrows. He takes our afflictions to be his afflictions. Look at how Christ responds. You can imagine him with his face and his tone of voice and the sighs that he's making and the steps that he makes as he's moving around. Verse 32, now when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to, to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And he knows. If he had been there, this friend whom he loves 
would not have died. When Jesus saw who weeping, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Jesus cares about us. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And when he saw, he did what? He wept. It's true. Lazarus, who I love, is in the tomb. He is dead. It's been four days. And just from how he wept over Lazarus, what was the conclusion of the Jews? So the Jews said, see what? How he loved him. And it doesn't end there. But some of them say, could he not open, uh, could, he, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? You know, that repetition, you know, Martha said if he had been there, he wouldn't have died. Mary said if he had been there, he wouldn't have died. Even though Martha and Mary's heart are in the right place, uh, these Jews here, their hearts are not in the right place, of course. Uh, this is in doubt. They're also asking the same question that he wouldn't have died, you know. This, this guy opened the eyes of the blind. He wouldn't have died. Uh, he, he, this man would not have died if, it was here, if he was here. And then verse 38 again. Jesus, then Jesus what? Deeply moved again. Came to the tomb. Jesus cares. He sympathizes with us. He knows why Lazarus is dead. He knows that sin has come into this world. And my friend whom I love is dead. He knows sin has come into this world and he whom I have saved will one day die. Or Pastor Tony or Elder Ken or Sister Liz or Sister Carol or Amos or Joseph. One day they will die. I love them. I am deeply moved. I'm troubled in my spirit. When they die, I weep. Precious is the death of the saints in the sight of? Yeah. That's the God we serve. That's Jesus for you. He loves you. And he has something. He, he does something about that thing that moves him to the point of weeping. He says he's the resurrection and the life. And how he is the resurrection and the life we've seen. He's the one who has come into the world to save us from our sins. He's the one whom is going to the cross. The one whom uh, the plans have been made to put him to death. That through his death, death might die. See how Jesus loves the saints. If you are a Christian... See how even at the very point of death, Christ is with you. He has a truth and a promise for you to transition you from life, from life here into life there, which is through death. Something you can remember as your last breath, as you are about to see your Savior, as you are about to sleep, as Jesus Christ refers to it at the very beginning. It's just sleep. This, the way when you fall asleep, you become ignorant of everything around you. Oh, when you sleep in Christ, you become ignorant of what's going on here, but you're awake to him. You see him for all his beauty. You're with Christ, that's how it's called. You're with the Lord. You are in paradise. That's the language of the death of a Christian. It's completely different compared to someone who is not a believer, someone who still has not believed, someone who does not glorify God. So brothers and sisters, um, as we come to a conclusion, as we see this Christ who sympathizes with us, as we see this Christ who, for the glory of God, allows Lazarus to die so that Mary and Martha might believe their, their faith must, might be strengthened, that God may be glorified, so that the many Jews 
who had previously opposed Jesus might believe. I ask you, do you believe? Do you believe? Has God been glorified in your life? It's, it's as simple as this today. And it's a matter of life and death. Because I am the resurrection and the life. There's, there, are, there are conditions there. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? It's, it's a matter of life and death. Does the resurrection of Lazarus point you to Christ? Who says that, leave the sign alone. I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life is me. That has happened because of me. Come to me. Come to me. And though you die, though thousands of years may pass, though you rot, even rotting will not keep the voice of Christ at bay when he comes back and with a loud cry reunites all of us to our bodies. Nothing can come in the way of God's love for us. So I ask you, do you believe? If you are a believer, are you strengthened by this? Do you have a response? Do you have an answer for death? When you yourself will die or when another brother is dying or a sister is dying? Do you have a response for death when an unbeliever dies? Self-examine yourself and at the end of it all, may God be glorified. That's it for today. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Okay. Sure. Yes. Please, please do. I, I don't know if there's a mic. There's no mic, but just be loud. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> mm. It's uh, encouraging to hear as well. Yeah, we we feed off one another. You know, it's not just the preacher who needs who encourages, but also the the one who is encouraged can also encourage the preacher as they hear uh, this. Yes, we thank the Lord for this truth. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, just to uh, wrap up, uh, next week we will continue. Uh, we will be looking at Jesus uh, Christ as uh, the way, the truth, and the life. And then we'll finish with Jesus Christ as the vine. Um, then there's going to be <clears throat> another session with uh, Pastor Tony to just wrap up, to tie everything all together. Uh, I'm grateful for Deacon Amos for uh, teaching last Sunday. Uh, you saw that uh, I am... This is, this is, these are overtones uh, that Christ uses to, to say that he is deity, he is God. So these words of Christ are, are the words of God. There's, a, there's God in these words. So may, may we also, uh, as we go along, you know, that, that uh, Bible study last week made spice and add some sauce into our understanding and our, our enjoyment and our savoring of these statements that Christ uh, says he is to us.